Hello, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Live at Frost Science. My name is Daniela Orihuela, and it is my pleasure today to be able to host one of our key players here at the museum, Dr. Kristen Dubay, also known as Dr. K. Uh, Dr. K has the great big job to be taking care of our animals. We have over 13,000 animals at Frost Science, from sharks to stingrays to fish to alligators and all sorts of birds. And she's going to be sharing with us today how to take care of animals in our museum. Dr. K, welcome. Hi there, how is everybody today? I am super excited you all are able to join us. And uh, I also want to introduce my co-presenter here. This is Ava. She's an American Kestrel. And I'll tell you a little bit more about her a little bit later, but hopefully she'll be happy enough to join us for most of the talk. Perfect. So Dr. K, today you are sharing with us um, specifically how to take care of our animals from birds to fish. Um, tell us a little bit, how did you end up working with Frost Science? Did you ever think that you'd be a veterinarian at the museum? Um, yeah, I have, oh, Ava has something to say about that. <laughs> um, yes, I have always loved wildlife. Um, I'm actually a Florida native, a Miami native, and um, uh, when I was growing up, I visited the what was known as the Museum of Science um, and developed a love of all uh, wildlife very early. Um, I also worked at an aquarium for many years before vet school. So I've always had an affinity for uh, sort of the wild and the exotic type animals. And uh, that led me uh, to frost when I turned to re uh, frost science when I returned to Miami again. So um, basically what I wanted to do today is talk to you all, um, kind of a big subject, but how we care for all of these um, super special and unique animals that we have at Frost Science. And uh, to, uh, to uh, you might excuse this pun, but we're gonna, give a, we're gonna have a bird's eye view of, of how we care for the animals in general. And um, if you all have any questions at any time, um, please feel free to chime in. I'd be happy to um, answer them as, as best I can. But uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, so to start, at Frost Science, we have a dedicated uh, purpose-built veterinary lab. Um, as you can see from these images, um, we have pretty much everything you would find in a um, normal veterinary hospital. We have an exam table where we can do exams, treatments, procedures. Um, on the photo to the right, you'll see our x-ray equipment uh, when we need it. We also have microscopes that we can look at um, samples from animals. And we have anesthesia equipment um, if we need to sedate an animal to do a procedure or a surgery. Um, so the mainstay of care in any zoo, aquarium, museum, anywhere is the team of people that cares for the animals. And we have uh, fortunately a super highly talented, highly trained team. They have um, overlapping complementary skill sets. So some people um, have more experience with certain types of animals than others, but um, basically it's, it's, it's a group effort um, from start to finish to make sure that every need of every animal at Frost Science is met. Um, that includes the environments that they live in, that includes the food that they receive, um, that includes um, things like disinfection, and then of course it includes education um, of our visitors and the public. And just if you want to um, excuse my second pun of the talk, they like to dive right in. <laughs> to their work. So we have a very diverse collection at Frost Science. Um, we, have, um, we have hundreds and thousands of species of different animals. Um, we have a very large collection of fish. Um, here you can see our silky shark and one of our mobula rays. 
Um, we have um, dozens of species of birds. Um, this is a wood duck at the top and two of our screech owls at the bottom. Um, we also care for um, many species of reptiles and amphibians. Um, this is an American crocodile up in the corner. And then of course, invertebrates. We have um, many, many types of invertebrates. We have an octopus and a coral species here. Um, we also care for jellyfish um, and different types of shrimp and um, cuttlefish. Um, we have a, a pretty diverse collection uh, that we work uh, really hard at every day caring for the best, the best way we can. So um, aside from our downtown Miami um, Biscayne Bay location, we also have um, an offsite facility called the Bachelor Environmental Center. Uh, which is located at FIU. This is a purpose-built center that is primarily a quarantine facility. Um, <laughs> quarantine before the last few months is probably a word that people have not used or heard of very often, but it has become a very common, commonly used word more recently. And uh, as most people would know by now, it is a period of isolation um, to ensure um, in this case, an animal, or it could be a group of animals, such as a school of fish, does not show any signs of disease, um, monitor behaviors to make sure that they're acting normally. We want to make sure that they're feeding properly. want to make sure in general that they're healthy and there's no chance that they can give any sort of disease um, to the population at frost. So um, quarantine is, is one of the um, the primary ways that we care for our animals. And it's, it's a proactive approach um, to animal care. We want to find that disease before it gets to the museum. We wanna make sure that um, any diseases present are um, treated. And that can be something as simple as a parasite or something more concerning. But we want to nip it in the bud, so to speak. So all of these um, aquatic systems here are um, purpose built, as I said, designed for different species of fish. Okay, so um, as I said, um, quarantine is one of the uh, mainstays of our animal care program. Um, another part of it is preventative medicine. So I'm going to talk about those um, both briefly, so you all have a little bit better understanding. Um, but first, I wanted to introduce our um, sea turtle. If anyone has visited Frost Science recently, they may have met our newest addition to the Gulf Stream exhibit. This is our loggerhead sea turtle, Miko. Uh, Miko is a um, sub-adult loggerhead that was um, found to have an affinity, unfortunately, for fishing gear. So she um, ate over the course of three years um, fishing gear uh, three different times, and each time was rescued by a facility um, in the Panhandle of Florida, was treated and released um, unfortunately, then to return about a year later. Um, now, after the third time, a decision um, was, was made by uh, the state government um, through the Fish and um, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission uh, that it wasn't safe for her to be released into the ocean again. Uh, there was a good chance, uh, seeing her record, that she was going to then turn around and eat more fishing gear. So she was treated for her problems and um, a home was found for her, fortunately for us, at Frost Science. So uh, she was one of, our, uh, one of our most recent residents at the Bachelor Environmental Center where she went through quarantine. Okay, so part of our quarantine is a thorough physical exam. And as I said earlier, we wanna make sure that these animals are as healthy as possible before they go into frost. Um, one of the ways that we um, do that is a thorough physical exam. We take samples from them, including blood uh, and feces. We check them for parasites, any abnormalities um, in their organ function through their blood work. And we document them um, by photographs. We take uh, lots of photos. Um, those are used as part of those, um, that animal's um, medical records. Um, so in this case, we were photographing her um, shell. And this, this is her plastron, the upper part of a turtle shell. And the next photo will show, uh, sorry, this is her carapace, the upper part of her shell. And the next photo will show her plastron, which is the underneath of her shell. 
So um, oftentimes we get questions about algae, um, sea turtles and algae, any aquatic turtle really, if anyone's seen freshwater turtles in Florida, there are, um, they're almost always covered with algae. It's um, kind of makes sense. They're in a, on exposed to sunlight. Um, uh, their shell is um, got these little nooks and crannies that algae likes to grow in and it doesn't hurt the turtle. So um, we just monitor them. We monitor them in general for any changes and photos we find are one of the best ways to do that. That's always part of our um, exams, our quarantine exams. So um, another part of a quarantine exam is identification. So um, once these animals leave quarantine, um, in some cases, it's almost impossible to identify them as individuals. If you think of a school of similar fish, um, we can't um, always identify individuals. Um, they are treated as uh, a school, a herd, if you will, um, of animals. And so those animals are um, treated as a, uh, a group, um, unless there's a problem with one of them, in which case um, we would isolate them and treat them for that problem. But in the case of smaller groups of animals, we like to identify them. Most people are very familiar with um, microchipping of small animals. Uh, maybe you have a dog or a cat that's been microchipped. That is one common way that we can identify animals is through microchipping. Um, you can also put a band. Um, banding is very common for birds. Uh, you put a colored band or a numbered band on their leg to identify them. Now, in the case of our juvenile alligators, um, we found it easier to actually look at their um, coloration on their scales. So you'll notice the one on the left has very sort of uniform lines on its back, and the one on the right has kind of like a jaggedy looking line on its back. Um, those scale patterns will stick with them for life. So it's a good way to identify them an easy way, a, a no stress way of identifying them, even from a distance. So, um, so we will, again, photograph and document them that way. Okay, so um, another part of our quarantine is um, acclimating animals in quarantine, and in some cases, training them. Now, um, many people think of um, training as um, something that um, is not a necessity, and it, it really, in a lot of cases, is. Um, it becomes very important for animals um, to be trained in order to um, examine them in some cases um, very closely in a low stress way. So these, um, in this picture here, you see two of our, um, our two, I should say, um, rosette spoonbills. Um, these animals were born at another facility and um, they were reared by people. So they are really comfortable with people um, being uh, raised by them. And we were treated, we have trained them um, to what's called target um, to a certain, um, in this case, um, dish or stand um, based on the color. Um, <laughs> you can see the one on the left is, is very, very hungry. Um, they were both at this time juveniles and uh, he just wants his food. But this is all, this is what training is all about. Um, it takes time, it takes patience. And um, if you can get them to target, in this case, um, on their little dish, um, you reward them with a food reward. And this was early on in their training. This is when they were um, still going through quarantine. Um, this allows the, um, the aviculturist to get a close look at the animal and um, also makes it easier when they're on exhibit. Um, the photo on the left is, um, is one of these birds being weighed. And um, in this case, we found the easiest thing for him to get into was a laundry basket. It was easier for him to stand on than the scale. And, um, and training um, in that sense means that it's not stressful for him to be weighed, which is the goal in all of this. Hi, Dr. Kennedy. So we have a couple questions. Um, first of all, um, it looks like the husbandry team all work together all the time. We have a question from uh, Juliana Restrepo of what are the qualifications that it takes to be uh, part of the husbandry team? So that's a good question. Everybody has a really diverse background. So um, some people have done marine science studies, um, undergraduate degrees in marine science, or some, um, some people with um, masters in um, marine science. Um, some people have done um, quite a bit of um, volunteer work. And that's 
Um, I would say one of, the, one of the main ways that people can get a great deal of experience, a surprising amount of experience is through volunteering. I think anyone that's been in the animal profession anywhere, um, that includes zoos, aquaria, um, a vet clinic, um, almost everybody there at one point had vol has volunteered. Um, you never know when a position will open if you have the right qualifications. Um, you know, in some cases, it's like a working interview. But um, but yeah, it's it's there's pretty diverse skill set. But volunteering is the way to go, I would say. And following from that, we actually have a question uh, from Lucy. How old do you need to be to volunteer? Um, I believe it's seventeen. I can't be. I can't promise you on that. Um, I will say though that on the frostscience.org website, um, the volunteer portion has all of the requirements because there are certain requirements uh, for working with the animals um, that it's not the case when you're doing, um, uh, there's plenty of volunteer positions at the museum. Some have um, direct contact with the animals and some um, don't. And those with direct contact with the animals um, have a slightly higher um, age requirement, but I would check the website because I'm, I'm not going to make promises that I remember that correctly. Definitely, definitely check the website uh, frostscience.org slash volunteer to learn more about all the different learning opportunities at the museum. Uh, now, the spoonbills are adorable. Um, we have a question from Marika saying, how did you get the spoonbills um, at the museum? Where did they come from? These, these spoonbills actually were, um, were born at SeaWorld. Um, these animals, they have a, um, uh, as, part of, as part of a species survival program, they have a breeding colony of rosit spoonbills. And um, when we wanted to showcase um, the species at the museum, we contacted them. And that's when they sent us um, two of these um, beautiful animals. Um, they arrived as juveniles, so they were both in their first year when they arrived. Um, they had, as I said earlier, been raised um, by their staff there, so they were very um, habituated to people, um, very comfortable around people, and we wanted to get them comfortable around us specifically, so um, that's when we started their training. Okay, so I've kind of covered um, the quarantine side of things. Um, now I just wanted to touch on another really important part of caring for animals. And again, this is another proactive step that we can take. Um, just as your dog or your cat or even yourself um, needs a, a physical exam, kind of a checkup, um, we do checkups on our, um, our collection usually about every one to two years, depending on the species. Um, that being said, there's some animals that um, we will not individually handle, such as our fish species, um, that causes them a great deal of stress and um, the negatives would weigh, outweigh the positives on some of those animals. But for the animals that are, um, we are able to handle regularly, such as our birds and um, our reptiles, we um, undergo wellness exams on them. Um, we want to check them, uh, in this case, um, from um, beak to feet. I uh, want to make sure that there's no problems, no um, nothing that we haven't noticed um, when we're doing our routine husbandry and care of them. Um, in these wellness exams, they the same sort of things happen um, that would happen in a um, dog and cat vet, vet clinic. We listen to their heart. Um, we check their eyes, their mouth, um, in this case also their feet, and um, we generally also take um, x-rays and um, we will perform blood work on them. And that just gives us a, a very holistic assessment of those of that particular animal, make sure that there's no underlying conditions that we are unaware of, and if anything does come up, we can um, treat it as needed. So in this case, um, here is one of our little box turtles and he was um, having his annual exam. Um, we have to be creative sometimes about um, how we do x-rays on various animals. Um, for this little guy, um, we put him on a, um, a roll of tape um, <laughs> that keeps him from, uh, that keeps him still while we're trying to do x-rays. Um, in the bottom right, you can see some of 
is x-ray images. Um, that dark area that you see, so this was a, a lateral view, so a view from the side, that dark area are his um, lung fields, and that would be um, something that we would look at as part of his um, x-ray series. Okay, and um, as I said earlier, we're we are monitoring um, different conditions um, for um, any changes. In this case, um, there was a bird that um, had a, um, a issue with cataracts. Um, birds can develop cataracts uh, just as dogs or cats or people can. Um, in this case, the cataracts were um, affecting this bird's behavior. Um, he wasn't eating as well, he wasn't acting normally, and um, we decided to consult with a board-certified ophthalmologist who um, um, basically uh, elected to um, uh, take him to surgery. So we decided that it was in his best interest to have cataract surgery to restore his vision and um and allow him to live more um comfortably and and happily um and his behavior improved after that surgery so all of these look like i uh, i love that picture of uh the turtle on the roll of tape by the way it's <laughs> so cute um so uh, i can see that there's a lot of different procedures uh that sometimes we need to do do you uh we have a question from marcella asking which animal is the most expensive to care for oh that's tough um it really depends on the animals. I mean, there's some that have a very specialized diet, um, and that so that has is nothing really to do with their with their veterinary care. Um, sometimes, like for instance, our mobula rays eat a um, very specific diet of um, of these um, basically tiny shrimp-like creatures, um, krill, and uh, and that can be very expensive um, to feed them. Um, and so sometimes it's, there, there isn't any one animal that has um, an expense as far as the, from the veterinary standpoint. Um, say if you take blood on a, um, on a bird versus a shark versus a fish versus um, a crocodile, um, that blood sample is gonna cost um, the same um, regardless of what animal you, you draw blood from. And there's things we do for free. The examination, obviously, and x-rays um, do not cost us anything. So um, those are um, low budget things that we can take advantage of that will give us a lot of good information about that animal. Okay, so um, we also we also do uh, sort of prophylactic or preventative treatments on um, animals that you would think um, that you really don't do anything with, and in this case, um, on corals um, as a precaution um, when we're transferring animals from one exhibit to another. Um, sometimes we give them um, medicated dips or baths. That's if there's any parasites present, anything um, that could be transferred from one animal to another. Uh, we wanna make sure that these um, animals are quote unquote clean as far as um, parasites or um, anything else that can cause disease. And so um, even things like corals receive um, treatments in between um, moving from system to system. Uh, likewise, we would do the same thing uh, for things like fish, if a fish was moving from one exhibit to the, to the other, uh, or a group of fish, we want to make sure that they don't have any um, potential parasites um, or diseases that can be transferred from one exhibit to another. So I mentioned earlier training, and a lot of people are surprised to hear that even our fish can be trained, and we actually have um, I think it's now three um, moray eels, two spotted eels and one green moray. This is a green moray here um, that are trained to um, swim to a specific target. So a target is an object um, that is used for training purposes. And in this case, um, at the end of this, um, I apologize, I don't have a picture of the, um, of the actual target, but there's a piece of PVC on the picture to the, to the left um, at the end of that piece of PVC pipe is a um, specifically shaped um, PVC or plastic object. And each moray eel is trained to go to its 
sh um, shaped target. And what that means is that, um, again, the um, aquarist um, or animal keeper can get a closer look at that animal um, when they swim up for their food. Um, and we, of course, know that they've eaten. And likewise, in this case, um, we, as a part of our normal um, rounds, uh, medical rounds to evaluate animals, we saw that this animal had some eye trauma and we were able to add antibiotics uh, to his fish and um, make sure that he uh, received those antibiotics because he targeted. So we were able to, even though he was one fish in a very large exhibit, uh, because he came for his food, we were able to treat him as an individual without handling him. Um, we were also, because he targeted so well, able to administer eye drops. So when he swam up and he paused for a moment to grab um, his medicated fish, we were able to give him eye drops. And if you look at that picture on the far right, um, that was after treatment. So you'll see a little bit of a white area on that eye, but it was mostly healed. So our treatment was successful. Okay. And a lot of times you have to be creative with our treatment. So um, in this case, we had a small bird in our aviary, a, a tern, um, that had some injuries to his feet. And we bandaged them, um, but really we wanted to return him to exhibit. That was where he was most happy. So what we did is we um, came up with a pattern for um, some uh, little neoprene um, coverings or shoes that we could um, apply to his feet. And um, we put them on him and he didn't mind them at all. So uh, he was... Um, he was pretty happy um, in the exhibit, and there he is with his little neoprene shoes on. Um, we fashioned them with a little bit of Velcro and um, a very lightweight neoprene um, that allowed his um, feet to heal while he was on exhibit. And that way he was um, not stressed um, being um, off exhibit. Um, exhibit. These animals um, like to be in their natural environment with their uh, with the other birds on exhibit, especially um, these animals that like to flock. And uh, so that worked out quite well for him. Adorable, completely adorable. Um, Dr. K, while I have you here, so um, we have a question from Ogun B regarding the previous slide on the eel. Do you happen to know how old uh, the eel was? Well, that's a good question. I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, he was a he was an adult but not a full grown adult because these guys can get pretty big and um i think we estimated him at about 40 to 50 pounds and i think they can get almost twice that so um i wouldn't consider him um a full grown adult so um probably at least at least five plus years, but I can't give you an exact age. Okay, so I'm going to briefly run through another part of um, Frost Science's animal care, and um, this is our wildlife rehabilitation. Um, we operate the Falcon Bachelor Raptor Rehabilitation Center, and as its name implies, we care for primarily birds of prey at this center, although we admit other um, native species um, of uh, Florida wildlife. And in this picture is a rescued um, barn owl that was being weighed. And, um, and yeah, towels are very commonly used um, to contain birds. It's a easy way to contain birds for something quick like a weight. Okay, so um, these animals a lot of times come into us with a, um, different problems. Um, on the left, you'll see there's a, a burrowing owl and that was an adult. Um, a lot of the adult animals come in um, either um, with signs of trauma and that can range from anything like a um, accidentally being hit by a car, um, window strikes, um, you hear about birds hitting windows, um, birds of prey, that can happen too as well. And um, sometimes they um, are encounter a toxin, um, they might eat something that is um, contaminated with poison and that can cause them to be very ill. 
Um, and a picture on the right is a uh, baby screech owl. In this case, this little guy fell from his nest. Um, but when these animals come to us, sometimes they aren't found right away. And um, a lot of times they come very cold. So the first thing we like to do is to make them warm. Um, one of the interesting things about um, birds in general is that their body temperature is very warm. Um, our body temperature, of course, is normally about 98.6. Um, most birds' body temperature runs between 104 and 110 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, you can imagine that the outside temperature um, in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, um, it still can be um, cold for them, especially if their um, body isn't functioning right or they're under stress or they're in shock. So um, the first thing we like to do um, as far as supportive care is to warm them up um, with heating pads and towels. <laughs> and sometimes we have to wrap them up with heating pads um, with a little, bit, a little bit exposed to make sure uh, everything is still going well. And uh, regarding triage and rescue, on a given day, uh, this is a question from Marcelo, around how many animals do you get to see? You know, it varies depending on um, on the season. So there is a um, raptor migration season that goes through um, sort of the winter into the early spring. And during that time, there are a lot more raptors in South Florida. And um, so there are um, peregrine falcons that come to Florida every year from different parts of the country and you will find them in some of the skyscrapers in downtown Miami hunting pigeons. Um, those animals um, come to us in the winter. There's also animals that breed um, in this part of the country, so um, you will find um, various species of hawks. So, um, you know, we've had days where we've had a dozen or more animals show up, and we've had days where we only have a few, and it, it really depends on the season. Our busiest season is during that raptor migration and breeding season. Okay, so this is Ava. <laughs> this is Ava um, and uh, these pictures that you showed that we're, we're just up there showed Ava and her, um, her issue um, or her reason for being with us um, is because she has an amputated, uh, partial amputation of her wing. Um, so Ava came to us um, several years ago with um, trauma to her wing. Um, she had a pretty substantial fracture. And um, unfortunately, um, as I've said earlier, a lot of times little animals aren't found right away when they're injured. And that was the case with her. And uh, once a fracture is left um, for several days, it doesn't heal properly. Um, the decision was made um, for her health that the best course of action was to amputate that, um, that part of the wing that was um, seriously um, injured. And Ava was seen to be a, um, a very likable bird and very happy around us and um, very happy to, um, to stay with us. So she fits all of the requirements um, for being uh, one of our amazing animal ambassadors. So Ava then joined Frost Science as uh, in a very important role as an animal ambassador. Um, she is uh, right now the only falcon that we have. Um, falcons can be identified by that little teardrop that you can see coming off of their eyes. Um, they also have a very um, sharply hooked beak. Um, in the wild, these guys will hunt um, other smaller birds, um, they will actually also um, hunt lizards, amphibians, um, you know, uh, bugs on occasion. Um, so they're, they're pretty skilled hunters. Um, these guys also can be migratory. Sometimes they stay pretty local. Um, but in her case, um, she, uh, she's been with us um, and um, as an animal ambassador now for, for several years. So another thing um, that Ava may let me do, we'll see, um, is I just wanted to show you. So a lot of times we get questions on, um, on how we do exams on birds. I'm not sure if Ava's gonna let me listen to our heart, but I might give it a try. Um, but one of the things that we do on animals that are used to it, and this is why um, training is very important, is because um, our first preference would be to be able to examine these animals 
um, without them getting um, stressed and um, having to um, hold them um, securely for exams. We'd like to just be able to examine them without any problem. So sometimes we can do this, sometimes we can't. Eva sometimes decides and lets me know that I cannot do this, but um, I'll show you how I listen to her heart or I'll give a, an attempt at showing how I listen to her heart. But basically I just put the stethoscope on her chest. She says, I think I'm gonna poop because of that. All right, so yeah, so I listened right here. Oh, I know Ava. She says, I'm not sure sure about this. Um, yeah. And basically, if I can listen to her chest, I can listen to either side right here. I can also listen um, down near her stomach. Let's see if I can go closer to see down here. And um, birds have air sacs throughout their body. Um, that is very important um, for their breathing. Um, it's, it, many people don't know this, but the way the air flows through a bird, it actually goes through their lungs on the way out of their body. Um, so when we breathe, the air goes into our lungs, oops, back up, um, and then out again. Um, you know, one way in, one way out. Birds, it doesn't work like that. The air actually passes through the air sacs in different parts of their body and then through the lungs on the way out. So they have a very unique um, anatomy. Um, that, in addition to um, a lot of their bones, um, not having marrow, but um, having air in them um, makes them uh, more lightweight and it helps them um, in flight. So one of the things we want to listen to besides her heart, I want to listen and make sure that her lung sounds clear, um, that I don't hear any abnormal breathing. Um, sometimes um, in, the, in the process of vocalizing, we can get a good look at um, inside her mouth and her gums, make sure um, her hydration looks good and um, she's nice and pink. Um, I can see from here, her eyes are very clear. Um, I won't be able to get a good look at, um, at her eyes with an ophthalmoscope, an instrument to look at her eyes. Um, I think she would be uncomfortable about that. Um, but in general, Ava's pretty healthy. Um, we've given her an exam in the last um, six, nine months, and um, she had a, a clean belt bill of health. Um, but we do check um, twice a year, and all of our um, birds, um, um, uh, poop samples for any sorts of parasites, and that's part of our, our uh, routine care of these guys. And as I said earlier, it's a day-to-day -day, um, team effort to really manage these animals and make sure that they're healthy. Um, the aviculturist who knows Ava the best um, will alert us if there's any signs that anything um, is different about her behavior or her feeding. Hi, Ava. <laughs> so we have a lot of questions regarding Ava. Yeah. First of all, uh, from Maria, can Ava still fly? She flies in very short bursts. So um, she is missing a good portion um, of her wing. Um, it's her right wing. And then unless she flaps a little bit, you won't really notice it. Um, because if I turn her around, you can't really notice. It doesn't look like anything is wrong on that side. So um, when, her, uh, when her wings are extended, you notice that one picture, that first picture we had when her wing was extended, you could see it. Um, but, um, but she does fly um, very short bursts, so she can kind of more hop than fly, but it, it gets her from point A to point B, but not, um, she can't fly from the ground um, up to a certain height that she can't do. But um, she's, she's a great, at, she's great at um, parkouring, I guess, I guess you would say. <laughs> and uh, we have a question uh, from Magali. Um, do we know exactly what happened to Ava? No, we don't. And that's the case, that's the case a lot of the times with these um, trauma patients is they come in with an injury and um, we can guess as to what happened. Um, in some cases, it's pretty obvious. Um, Every once in a while, you'll find a bird, um, say a um, an osprey that um, got caught up in fishing gear because osprey eat fish. Um, that's that's obvious what the trauma was. Um, electrocutions kind of have a certain look to them, 
Um, and unfortunately, gunshot wounds um, have a certain look to them. Um, but in Ava, Ava's case, we don't know how she broke her wing. Oh, no. Well, I'm so glad that she is a star with us. Yes. Um, I'm going to go back to the presentations that okay. will more of Ava's wing. Sure. There we go. Okay, so yeah, so that's a good picture of Ava's wing. So you'll see that when her wing is extended, you can kind of notice um, the one wing versus the other. Um, the one wing ends prematurely. Um, that's where that amputation was done. Um, once that wing is amputated, she, she feels no pain from it. So um, she's never had a problem with it. Um, we, we watch her for signs that she's um, picking at it. Um, that can be a sign after a surgery that an animal is uncomfortable with an amputation site. And she never did that. She's, um, she's never had a problem with it. So um, she's fortunate that um, she is uh, fine with her, with her current condition. Okay, so I mentioned earlier, um, one of the ways that we examine animals is um, through x-rays or radiographs. Um, this picture on the left, unfortunately, is an example of a gunshot um, wound in a bird. Um, this animal had um, been shot in its right wing, and you can see um, the bones there um, are broken in a few different spots, and then that um, very white looking object um, in the middle of the picture, that's the bullet fragment that's left in that bird's wing. Um, the picture on the left, um, or sorry, the picture on the right is a picture of the legs of a bird. Um, this bird actually fractured both of its legs. Um, we, again, this is one of those that we don't know how this happened. Um, this bird was found this way. Um, and uh, we were, um, we did actually a surgery where we inserted um, metal pins into this bird's, um, this bone is called the tibiotarsus. Um, it's kind of like the a combination of the, um, the tibia and fibula in our legs, the lower, like below our knee, I should say. And, um, and this, this bird had surgery on both of its legs to repair that. Okay, and other types of trauma. Um, so this little guy on the left, um, this is the same little, um, or in both of these pictures, it's the same little owl. Um, this guy fell out of his nest and, um, and had, a, had a hard time on his way down and um, broke the tip of his beak. Um, this is not a huge problem, especially in a young bird. Um, in his case, um, we, we treated it by cleaning it daily. Um, he was put on some antibiotics. And um, he was put on, there was a little bit of ointment put on the end of his wing. Unfortunately, um, it's a hard area to keep clean. So every time he was fed, um, we would clean up his beak. And beak is made of keratin. Um, and the inside layer is sort of like the, the inside, like the quick of your nails. So um, the beak will grow back. Um, and in this case, um, he grew back that little damaged tip. Um, it's that little hook on the end of his beak that's actually important to these guys um, because it helps them tear up their food. So, but um, he healed up just fine. Um, the guy on the right, um, this is a, a hawk that came to us with a neck injury and um, we applied a neck brace to his neck and he underwent physical therapy about every day or two um, to exercise his neck, um, help him re regain the strength and mobility on his neck so we could release him. Um, we also do surgery on um, animals that are injured. Um, this is a little owl um, that, um, again, had a, a rough fall from a tree. Um, in this case, he um, had a little cut beneath um, his right eye um, that required um, some very small sutures to be put in his eyelid. Um, it was, a, it, although it, was, it wasn't a large cut, it's an important area because we wanted to make sure that his eyelids closed properly um, we didn't want him to have problems later in life um, with his eyes um, if that eyelid didn't, didn't close properly and keep his eye moist. Um, now this guy um, is, is actually an adult screech owl. Uh, he came to us um, after being, um, we believe, trapped somewhere for several days. Um, he was found, I believe this guy was found on somebody's porch, uh, screened in porch. Um, they didn't know he was there. He arrived very dehydrated. 
Um, now, one of the things that we find when animals are dehydrated that it actually affects their eyes as well. And in this case, um, he developed um, a, an ulcer across his eye. Now, the reason it's green is we use a special stain. Um, the stain actually sticks to areas of the cornea, the outer surface of the eye that are damaged. And in his case, we found that he had a pretty big ulcer um, across his eye, so a damaged part of that outer layer um, of the cornea. Um, we were able to treat it with um, antibiotic drops that we applied to his eyes several times a day, and he recovered just fine. We also receive numerous babies um, at the wildlife clinic. And um, one of the most common species of wildlife um, babies that we receive are um, screech owls. They are very common in Florida. Um, here are two of our resident screech owls. On the left um, of the group photo is um, Beaker. Um, he is, or she, sorry, is um, a sort of brown phase um, a brown colored screech owl and the owl on the right is Lucille. She's a red, called a red phase, that's her coloring. And uh, there's another picture of <laughs> Beaker on the right. Um, they have both acted as surrogates and here is Beaker being a surrogate. So this is a little baby that fell from, from its nest. Now the reason this is important is of uh, twofold. One is that um, these guys are, um, are very impressionable at this age. We do not want them to be habituated um, people think of the word imprinted on humans. We want them to grow up as um, healthy owls that have a respect or even fear of humans. Um, that is the best way for them to survive in the wild. Uh, the best way for that to happen is for them to be raised by their parents. Now, in this case, of course, um, we don't know where their parents are um, or we can't get them back to them. Um, and we do re-nest in cases that we can. Um, if babies have fallen out of a tree and mom and dad are still there, we try to get them back to mom and dad again. Um, but otherwise, um, Lucille and Beaker are both um, surrogates. They will not only um, uh, basically spend time with the babies, but they will also feed them. And that is sort of, um, it's, a, it's sort of an, a, a a skill that is um, that either they have or they don't. Um, Lucille is a better surrogate. Um, she's a better feeder of babies um, than Beaker, but both of them have been used um, for that purpose. And when Beaker or Lucille are off duty, a little stuffed animal will give comfort to babies as well. Now, once these animals have recovered from their um, their trauma, or in this case, are um, old enough to survive on their own. Um, if it's a baby that's been uh, raised by um, our owls and by us, um, we like to do what's called a soft release. And what that means is um, we have uh, trained volunteers that um, are familiar with birds of prey and wildlife, and um, they have offered to put nest boxes in their yards. and. So this is a, a little owl on the left that is ready for a soft release. And there's a nest box. So the nest box is only um, sort of a halfway house um, before they are um, fully released into the wild. They can come and go from that nest box as often as they want. Um, the responsibility of the volunteer is to um, supply that nest box with uh, food for the, the baby for um, a few days to a week or so. And as long as that food keeps getting um, taken, um, we keep offering it. And eventually they, um, they are trained um, to hunt. We put them through um, training um, um, on, on certain prey. Um, we use insects a lot for training them. Um, they have a natural prey drive and they will go after um, animals like that. And it sort of teaches them what appropriate food items they can find in the wild. So this is a way that we release our babies. Now, Dr. K, we have yes. a question from uh, Yam, who is five. He's yes. asking, um, are owls very wise? And if so, <laughs> are owls wise? I think they're some of the most wise creatures. Um, they have, um, they have the ability to see in very low light. Um, they have the ability to find um, their prey through 
um, through what they can hear and what they can see in um, almost in the dark, which is something um, very unique to have. And, um, and they fly very quietly. Um, they have specially adapted feathers to fly very quietly so they can catch their prey um, without scaring it off. So I think all of those things make owls very wise. Thank you. I believe in the next one we see you in action. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the next. Oh, one. yes. Okay. So this is just a quick video of a hawk that's being released. And the reason this is called a hard release is because um, we basically bring them to an appropriate spot. In this case, it was a, 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 a field with a tree line. And um, we um, normally have, if you see, I took something off of that bird's head. Um, we transport them with a small leather hood. It, um, it basically covers their eyes, um, reduces stimulus, it makes them more comfortable in transport. And then right before release, we take off that hood and we let them go. They, um, uh, adult animals um, naturally have a fear of us and they want to get away from us. So usually um, by the time they're ready for release, it's no problem and they will fly away as fast as they can. Um, now for these adult animals, we try to return them to um, very nearby to where they were rescued, um, if we know that information. Um, we don't want to return them to an unsafe area, but we want to return them to the territory where they came from. Um, they will assimilate better, so they'll um, be used to that area, where to hunt, where to nest. Um, and so we want to we want to return them to an area they're comfortable. I liken it to um, you're familiar in your neighborhood and um, uh, you know where things are located, you know where the stores are, you know where you can get food. Um, and you know where you can get shelter, and that's the same for these guys. Okay, so we have exciting news on the horizon. Um, we are in conjunction with um, the Bachelor Foundation building a new wildlife clinic, and uh, this is just a um, schematic of the plans that we have. Um, we're going to have a large uh, free flight cage for the final stages of rehabilitation of large birds of prey. Um, we're gonna have classrooms um, for students and this is um, a mock-up of the flight cage. Um, this is for animals that have gotten to the point where they are recovered from their injuries and they need to build up some strength again. Um, many birds of prey are, many hawks and falcons are athletes and we want them to be as fit as possible before they are released. Lucio wanted to do a little um, emailing, so I said that was fine. So no, it's yeah. awesome. She's <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. K, for joining Thank us. You. I have a, a couple more questions. Yes. Um, one from Renee's daughter asking, when do the birds sleep and wake up? Mm -hmm. So, um, so the birds that are um, diurnal, and I don't know if people are familiar with that word, but nocturnal is, um, is animals that are awake at night, like most owls. Um, diurnal um, animals, um, such as we are, are awake during the day and sleep at night. So um, when it gets dark out, they will, um, they will start to settle down and they will start to sleep. Um, they uh, will sleep usually in little spurts, um, they're going to be very alert to their surroundings, so they might hear something that wakes them up, but they, um, all of our diurnal birds will sleep um, at night as we do. And uh, a question from Lucas. Yes. What is your favorite animal to treat, if you have one? Oh, that's a hard one. Oh my gosh, Lucas. Um, I have lots of favorites. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I love um, a lot of the birds. Um, I'm very fond of the owls in particular. Um, spent a lot of time with the owls. Um, in my previous job, I spent a lot of time with sea turtles. So I guess I would say sea turtles are some of my favorites too, but I have lots of favorites in lots of different categories. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. For You're welcome. Uh, and thank you, Ava, for joining us today also. <laughs> she said, no problem. I enjoyed it. <laughs> 
Um, so for all of you uh, watching today, thank you so much for joining. Uh, if you'd like to uh, learn more about our animals, please visit our website. Also, if you are able to support us uh, at this moment with the museum being temporarily closed, uh, we urge you to uh, look at our website, frostscience.org slash donate um, to help support all of our wonderful animals and our staff. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Next week on April 22nd, we have Shannon Jones, our conservation programs manager, who's going to be talking um, a little bit about the many things that we can do even from home um, regarding the different um, threats that face our planet today in celebration of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Again, thank you all very much and have a great day. Bye. Bye.